Well, hello, and thank you for joining me. Uh, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper today. Uh, we will have a time to meditate and come to a place of calm before we do that. All you'll need is a humble and contrite heart, some bread, and a beverage. But let's begin with a prayer for our beleaguered nation. Father God, thank you for the reminder today that when Jesus reigns, he will have, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, destroyed every ruler and authority and power. Unlike our earthly leaders, Jesus' rule will be perfect and peaceful. And Creator David knew you well. He prayed in Psalm 39, verse 7, Lord, where do I put my hope? Only hope is in you. This statement is so simple and so true. Our only hope is in you, Father. And thank you that you are the exact center for both hope and certainty. May the Apostle Paul's exhortation in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, become the goal of every political party. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. Place these words deep into the hearts of all our leaders, and in our hearts too. May we focus first on rich or poor, conservative or liberal, red or blue. You made us all. Father, when Paul urges people to forgive one another, he's not being weak. He's standing in your strength. And we praise you for the gift of forgiveness, and we ask that it may be extended through those who lead and those who follow. May grace abound. Lord, it's time to head back to school, and we thank you for those who lead in education that seek your will first. Be with administrators, teachers, and staff members who throw open the doors of countless schools to welcome students. Give them energy and encouragement. Help them to find joy in their jobs as straight their joy in you. The stars and athletes who light up the screens and fill stadiums have huge influence. Father, we pray that they would call on you before they exercise that influence, and may they feel an equal degree of responsibility to you for how they shape our culture. Speak to them, Lord. Amen. Today's scripture is found in the book of Ant 5. So please follow along in your own Bible. I will be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Isaiah 53, 3 and 5. Let us hear the word of God. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. And punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. This is the word of the Lord. Praise and thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, as we consider your word today, we ask for your wisdom, your insight, and your understanding. We ask that you will anoint the words we hear, that you will make them clear, and whatever you would have us understand, that we would take that understanding deep into our hearts. For we ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Amen. Well, today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Recently, I completed reading a book by John MacArthur titled The Gospel of God. And it's a wonderful dissertation on Isaiah 53.5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Now MacArthur ends his book with Charles Spurgeon's sermon on Isaiah 53.3, titled The Man of Sorrows. And I've titled today's message, The Man of Sorrows, because as I was praying and asking for the Spirit's leading, to a message appropriate for our celebration of the Lord's Supper, I really felt led to share Charles's sermon with all of you. 
Now, Charles's message is quite long, so I'll only share one of its points. Now, this might give some seminarians uh, listening palpitations because I'm not going to do all three points. If so, my suggestion is to go online and read the whole of it because it is a great message. Now, the language is a bit rough on today's ear because it's somewhat archaic. But trusting in the Spirit's power to grant us understanding, I believe Spurgeon's words will bless and prepare us to come to the Savior's table later. The Man of Sorrows by Charles Spurgeon Possibly a murmur will pass round the congregation. This is a dreary subject and a mournful theme. But, oh, beloved, it is not so, for great as were the woes of our Redeemer, they are all over now and are to be looked back upon with sacred triumph. However severe the struggle, the victory has been won. The laboring vessel was severely tossed by the waves, but she has now entered into the desired haven. Our Savior is no longer in Gethsemane, agony cross expiring. The crown of thorns has been replaced by many crowns of sovereignty. The nails and spear have given way to the scepter. Nor is this all, for though the suffering is ended, the blessed results never end. We may remember the travail, for the man-child is born into the world. The sowing in tears is followed by a reaping in joy. The bruising of the heel of the woman's seed is well recompensed by the breaking of the serpent's head. It is pleasant to hear of battles fought when a decisive victory has ended war and established peace. So that the double reflection that all the work of suffering is finished by the Redeemer and that henceforth he beholds the success of all his labors. We shall rejoice even while we enter into fellowship with his suffering. Let it never be forgotten that the subject of the sorrows of the Savior has proved to be more efficacious for comfort to mourners than any other theme in the compass of revelation or out of it. Even the glories of Christ afford no such consolation to afflicted spirits as the suffering of Christ. Christ is in all attitudes the consolation of Israel, but he is most so as a man of sorrows. Troubled spirits turn not so much to Bethlehem as to Calvary. They prefer Gethsemane to Nazareth. The afflicted do not so much look for comfort to Christ as he will come a second time in splendor of state as to Christ as he came the first time, a weary man full of woes. The passion flower yields us the best perfume. The tree of the cross bleeds the most healing balm. Like in this case cures like, for there is no remedy for sorrow beneath the sun like the sorrows of Emmanuel. As Aaron's rod swallowed up all the other rods, so the griefs of Jesus make our griefs disappear. Thus you see that in the black soil of our subject, light is sown for the righteous. Light which springs up for those who sit in darkness and in the region of the shadow of death. Let us go then without reluctance to the house of mourning and commune with the chief mourner, who above all others could say, I am the man that hath seen affliction. We will not stray from our text this morning, but keep to it so closely as to even dwell upon each of its words. The words shall give us our divisions. A man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. There is no novelty to anyone here, present, anyone listening, in the doctrine of the real and actual manhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But although there be nothing novel in it, there is everything important in it. Therefore, let us hear it again. This is one of those gospel church bells which must be rung every Sabbath day. This is one of those provisions of the Lord's household, which, like bread and salt, should be put upon the table at every spiritual meal. 
This is the manna which must fall every day round about the camp. We can never meditate too much upon Christ's blessed person as God and as man. Let us reflect that he who is here called a man was certainly very God of very God, a man and a man of sorrows, and yet at the same time God over all, blessed forever. He who was despised and rejected of men was beloved and adored by angels, and he who from men hid their faces in contempt was worshipped by cherubim and seraphim. This is the great mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He who was God and was in the beginning with God was made flesh and the highest stooped to become the lowest. The greatest took his place among the least. Strange and needing all our faith to grasp it, yes, it is, yet it is true that he who sat upon the wall of Sychar and said, Give me to drink, was none other than he who digged the channels of the oceans and poured into them the floods. Son of Mary, thou art also son of Jehovah. Man of the substance of thy mother, thou art also essentially deity. We worship thee this day in spirit and in truth. Remembering that Jesus Christ is God, it now behooves us to recollect that his manhood, it differed from our own humanity in the absence of sin, but it differed in no other respect. It is idle to speculate upon the heavenly manhood, as some have done, who have by their very attempt at accuracy been borne down by whirlpools of error. It is enough for us to know that the Lord was born of a woman, wrapped in swaddling bands, laid in a manger, manger, and needed to be nursed by his mother as any other child. He grew in stature like any other human being, and as a man we know that he ate and drank, that he hungered and thirst, rejoiced and sorrowed. His body could be touched and handled, wounded and made to bleed. He was no, but a man of flesh and blood, even as ourselves, a man needing sleep, requiring food, and subject to pain, and a man who, in the end, yielded up his life to death. There may have been some distinction between his body and ours, for inasmuch as it was never defiled by sin, it was not capable of corruption. Otherwise, in body and in soul, the Lord Jesus was perfect man after the order of our manhood, made in the likeness of sinful flesh, and we must think of him under that aspect. Our temptation is to regard the Lord's humanity as something quite different from our own. We are apt to spiritualize it away and not to think of him as really bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. And this is akin to grievous error. We may fancy that we are honoring Christ by such conceptions, but Christ is never honored by that which is not true. He was a man a real man, a man of our race, the son of man, indeed a representative man, the second Adam. And as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now this condescending participation in our nature brings the Lord Jesus very near to us in relationship, inasmuch as he was man, though also God. He was, according to the Hebrew law, our goel, our kinsman, our next of kin. Now, it was according to the law that if an inheritance had been lost, it was the right of the next of kin to redeem it. Our Lord Jesus exercised his legal right and seeing us sold into bondage and our inheritance taken from us, came forward to redeem both us and all our lost, lost estate. Blessed thing it was for us that we had such a kinsman. When Ruth went to glean in the fields of Boaz, it was the most gracious circumstance in her life that Boaz turned out to be her next of kin. 
and we who have gleaned in the Lord that his only begotten Son is the next of kin to us, our brother born for adversity. It would not have been consistent with divine justice for any other substitution to have been accepted for us except that of a man. Man sinned, and man must make reparation for the injury done to the divine honor. The breach of the law was caused by a man, and by man must it be repaired. Man had transgressed, man must be punished. It was not in the power of an angel to have said, I will suffer for man, for angelic sufferings would have made no amends for human sins. But the man, the matchless man, being the representative man, and of right by kinship allowed to redeem, stepped in, suffered what was due, made amends to the injured justice, and thereby set us free. Glory be to his blessed name. And now, beloved, since the Lord thus showed a suitableness to become our Redeemer, I trust that many listening who have been under bondage to Satan will see in that same human nature an attraction leading them to approach him. Sinner, thou hast not come to an absolute God. Thou art not bidden to draw nigh to the consuming fire. Thou mightest well tremble to approach him whom thou hast so grievously offended. But there is a man ordained to mediate between thee and God. And if thou wouldst come to God, thou must come through him, the man, Christ Jesus. God out of Christ is terrible out of his holy places. He will by no means spare the guilty. But look at yonder son of man. His hand no thunder bears. No terror clothes his brow, no bolts to drive your guilty souls to fiercer flames below. He is a man with hands of blessing, eyes wet with pity, lips overflowing with love. In his side, through that wound, there is a highway to his heart, and he who needs his compassion may soon excite it. O sinners, the way to the Savior's heart is open, and penitent seekers shall never be denied. Why should the most despairing be afraid to approach the Savior? He has deigned to assume the character of the Lamb of God. I never knew even a child that was afraid of a lamb. The most timorous will approach a lamb. And Jesus used this argument when he said to every laboring and heavy laden one, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. I know you feel yourselves sad and trembling, but need you tremble in his presence? If you are weak, your weakness will touch his sympathy, and if your mournful inability will be an argument with his abounding mercy. If I were sick and might have my choice where I would lie, with a view to healing, I would say, place me where the best and kindest physician upon earth can see me. Put me where a man with great skill and equal tenderness uh, will have me beneath his eye. I shall not long groan there in vain. If he can heal me, he will. Sinner, place thyself by an act of faith today beneath the cross of Jesus. Look up to him and say, Blessed Physician, Thou whose wounds for me can heal, whose death for me can make me live, look down upon me. Thou art man, thou knowest what man suffers. Thou art man, wilt thou let a man sink down to hell who cries to thee for help? Thou art man, and thou canst save, and wilt thou let a poor, unworthy one who longs for mercy be driven into hopeless misery while he cries to thee to let thy merits save him? O oh, ye guilty ones, have faith that ye can reach the heart of Jesus. Sinner, fly to Jesus without fear. He waits to save. It is his office to receive sinners and reconcile them to God. Be thankful that you have not to go to God at the first and as you are, but you are invited to come to Jesus Christ and through him to the Father. May the Holy Spirit lead you to devout meditation upon the humility of our Lord. And so may you find the door to light, the portal of peace, 
the gate of heaven. Then let me add, before I leave this point, that every child of God ought also to be comforted by the fact that the Redeemer is one of our own race, seeing that he was made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. And he was tempted in all points, like as we are, that he might be able to succor them that are tempted. The sympathy of Jesus is the next most precious thing to his sacrifice. I stood by the bedside of a Christian brother the other day, and he remarked, I feel thankful to God that our Lord took our sicknesses. Of course, he said, the grand thing was that he took our sins, but next to that, as I, as a sufferer, feel grateful that he also took our sicknesses. Personally, I also bear witness that it has been, to me, in seasons of great pain, superlatively comfortable to know that in every pang which racks his people, the Lord Jesus has a fellow feeling. We are not alone, for one like unto the Son of Man walks the furnace with us. The clouds which float over our sky have aforetime darkened the heavens for him also. He knows what strong temptations mean, for he has felt the same. How completely it takes the bitterness out of grief to know that it once was suffered by him. The Macedonian soldiers, it is said, made long forced marches, which seemed to be beyond the power of mortal endurance. But the reason for their untiring energy lay in Alexander's presence. He was accustomed to walk with them and bear the like fatigue. If the king himself had been carried like a Persian monarch in a palaquin in the midst of easy, luxurious state, the soldiers would soon have grown tired. But when they looked upon the king of men himself, hungering when they hungered, thirsting when they thirsted, often putting aside the cup of water offered to them and passing it to a fellow soldier who looked more faint than himself, they could not dream of repining. Why, every Macedonian felt that he could endure any fatigue, if Alexander could. This day, assuredly, we can bear poverty, slander, contempt, or bodily pain, or even death itself, because Jesus Christ, our Lord, has borne it. it shall become a fair thing to be made a mockery for him. By the buffeting and blindfolding, it shall become an honor to be disgraced. And by the cross, it shall become life itself, to surrender life for the sake of such a cause and so precious a master. May the man of sorrows now appear to us and enable us to bear our sorrows cheerfully. If there be consolation anywhere, surely it is to be found in the delightful presence of the crucified. A man shall be a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest. Now then, what shall I say in conclusion but just this? Let us admire the superlative love of Jesus. O oh, love, love, what hast thou done? What hast thou not done? Thou art omnipotent in suffering. Few of us can bear pain. Perhaps fewer still of us can bear misrepresentation, slander, and ingratitude. These are horrible hornets which sting as with fire. Men have been driven to madness by cruel scandals which have distilled from venomous tongues. Christ throughout life bore these and other sufferings. Let us love him as we think of how much he must have loved us. Will you try today before you come to the Lord's table to get your soul saturated with the love of Christ? Let them a soak in his love till like a sponge ye drink into your own selves the love of Jesus. And then, as it were, to let that love flow out of him again. While ye sit at his table and partake of the emblems of his death and of his love, admire the power of his love, and then pray that you may have a love somewhat akin to it in power. Amen. Father, we thank you for Charles Spurgeon's words of inspiration. And we ask that 
as we meditate on them, that you would prepare our minds and hearts to come to your table with a spirit of confession and thankfulness, to share the great gift of forgiveness through your Son, our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. At this time, you should pause, meditate on what we just heard, and prepare yourself to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It was a certain man, Jesus the Christ, who on a certain night, the night he was betrayed, commanded his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. And this is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper, because Jesus commanded us to do so, and because we never want to forget the price that was paid for our disobedience, our sin. Jesus, in complete submission and obedience to the Father, took on the punishment for all of our sins as a man. He bled and died as payment so that we would not have to receive God's wrath, the Father's wrath. He did it out of love. So I invite all who know Jesus as Lord of their lives, even those who may have come to him this very morning, to share in this meal. Gracious Father, Bless this bread as a reminder of your son's sacrifice and of the unity of his body. Remind us of the hope that we have in you. Bless also this cup as a sharing in the death of our dear Lord as we die to ourselves and live for you. Thank you for your love and forgiveness. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let us now eat and drink together. Lord Jesus, may we be refreshed and renewed through the sharing of this bread and this cup. For we praise you and we thank you. Amen. Receive now a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen and amen. Well, thank you again for joining me. It truly is a blessing on me. And I hope that Charles's message really resounded for you, as it did for me. That we might never forget that God took on human form, became a real man to suffer real things as we do, that he came to earth for that very purpose, to be a man who might die to pay for all of our disobedience. And may we never forget that, that Jesus Christ, though fully man, was also fully God and is capable of forgiving our sins and wants us to join him in paradise forever. Thank you again. And if you need prayer 
or just someone to talk with, uh, just send me your contact information by messaging me on, fa on my Facebook page, Roland, no D, Deloach. I promise to get back to you in a timely fashion. And may your week be filled to overflowing with the love of Christ. And may you dance before him until we meet again, whether here or in heaven above. God bless you.